Chuck, can you guys hear me okay? If I sit yeah. back here, still good? Good? All right. Um, so, thanks, Kyle Tyak. Tyak. The name of this talk is How HTML5 Killed My Career. Um, not exactly pertinent, but I'll get to that in a second. How many people here have developed? Take the mic hold it. Oh, I don't have a mic anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you guys can hear me without this, but maybe not. The acoustics in here are pretty good. So, uh, Anybody here developed in Flash before? I get a raise of hands. Wow, oh, quite a few. All right, guys. And front-end developers who think Flash was the worst thing ever invented? All right, so about equal parts on that half. Um, we'll talk after the session. I want to find out why people hate Flash so much. I've always been curious in that. Uh, I've never really gotten a straight answer other than JavaScript is better. Um, but hopefully we'll convince you that maybe you know, your tool of choice uh, doesn't matter as much as you might have thought before. So as I mentioned, uh, talks called How HTML5 Killed My Career. A more pertinent title might be How HTML5 Changed the Direction of My Career. Um, it didn't necessarily kill it so much as it, it shifted the way I had to learn and, and what I had to learn to stay in business. Um, so a better title might have been What I Learned Spending Way Too Many Years Focusing All of My Attention on Flash, Leaving Me Unprepared When HTML5 Became the New Hot Development Tool for the Interwebs, and Causing Me to Miss Out on Valuable Business Opportunities, which caused a lull in my workload and forced me to finally sit down and learn all the cool new things that I could do with HTML5. Problem with that is that title was a bit too long to submit, and obviously it wasn't uh, as I guess cool sounding is how HTML5 killed my career, and probably that spoke better to the half of the audience that hates Flash. Um, so what this talk is and isn't about, uh, this talk will be about Flash and about HTML5. It won't be about the great debate and which one is better. Uh, I won't be leaning to one side or the other uh, in regards to which tool you should use or should have used in the past. Uh, it's going to be more about looking over at you know, kind of where we came from and how Flash laid some of the foundation work for HTML5. Um, so. This is really a story about learning to appreciate your tools and value them, uh, the ones we have at our disposal at the time, and figuring out how to use them as developers to our advantage. Most often this means choosing the right tool for the job, but occasionally it means working with what you have available. Um, and this is kind of how my journey with Flash began. Um, you know, at the time it was early 2000s, there was a lot of issues with cross-browser uh, consistency. Um, you know, a lot of workarounds to try to get things to work in IE9 and Firefox and Netscape. Ugh. Um, but Flash, you know, kind of provided a band-aid to allow you to develop once and distribute that content across multiple platforms. And it worked pretty well most of the time. Um, so let's take a look back. 2001, uh, Flash was just kind of getting into its, I guess, more professional days. It started off earlier with some simple animations and such. But in 2001, uh, they released a new feature for ActionScript 1.0, uh, which was a really important feature because it allowed you to start scripting within the application, which then allowed you to develop software as opposed to just putting a few lines of code uh, that might let you jump to a frame or something like that. Um, and what I've got up here is kind of a, a differentiator showing the difference between Flash uh, and ActionScript 1.0 and JavaScript at the time. Now, they're both based on ECMAScript, so you know, in the beginning, they both looked fairly similar. Uh, the big things you'll notice here is the difference between console.log and trace. Um, that was really just you know, method naming. So not a lot of differences in the early days uh, between JavaScript and ActionScript. But over the next 10 years or so, um, until 2007, seven years, I guess, um, ActionScript 3 was released in 2007, and, and during that time between 2000 and 2007 and AS1 and AS3, uh, a lot of changes happened in ActionScript. The language became class-based. Uh, There's a lot of improvements in the structure and the functionality of the language. Um, JavaScript roughly stayed the same, and it has until very recently when we started seeing uh, improvements to ECMAScript with ECMAScript 5 and 6 or 2015 and 2016 now. Um, so when you look at ActionScript 3, Here's another comparison between JavaScript and ActionScript 3 when, when AS3 was released in 2007. As you'll notice, JS didn't really change at all. It's the same prototypical language. Um, it doesn't really have any new features. Uh, it's still written the exact same as it was seven years earlier. Uh, Flash, on the other hand, as I mentioned, fully class-based. Ideas of public and private properties, uh, strict data typing, compile time error checking for uh, data types, um, public and private classes, inheritance. All these concepts, what's really allowed you to start developing software, as I mentioned, in an object-oriented way. Um, so at the time, you know, I had to go from learning to hack some code together to learning to be a software developer, which was really a big shift. Um, so let's look at some of the features that really made Flash uh, a winner, I guess, in the space, or differentiated between you know, JavaScript and HTML at the time. Uh, one of the big ones was animation. Uh, Flash was one of the first tools that really allowed artists to uh, start sharing their work online, and animators specifically. 
Um, it developed uh, or brought about a whole new generation of, of animators uh, who were able to share their content online. And if you guys can't hear me, please just wave. Um, so this is just an example here. This is uh, an animation from simonscats.com, a guy named Simon Tofield. He's done a number of these uh, animations about his cats. Uh, I believe they're all done mostly on the timeline in Flash. Um, and timeline animation as an, an IDE tool was uh, really useful for people that were traditionally used to using you know, pen and paper or things like Photoshop. They now had similar tools in Flash, but they could actually bring them to life and share them with people online. Um, later reversions of uh, the Flash player came with uh, 3D animation. So now we had hardware acceleration and the ability to do some really, really insane graphics. Uh, this was a game that was released for the Adobe Max conference in 2011. Um, it also showcased a new feature of peer-to-peer -peer communications. So this was actually a racing game where all the Flash players uh, would connect to all the other players of the game. So you were all connected directly peer-to-peer -peer, uh, to exchange game data, exchange positions, um, et cetera. And we'll touch a little bit more on that later. But as you can see, I mean, it was some pretty impressive graphics that could be achieved using just Flash. And again, at the time, there wasn't anything even close to this available in HTML or JavaScript. Audio is another big one. Um, you know, the ability to stream audio content gave people a new way to share and discover music online. Uh, so sites like uh, Pandora and uh, Groove Shark and a number of others came out that allow you to discover new music in interesting ways. Um, Flash and ActionScript also gave you the ability to work with audio at much lower levels. So you could actually interact with the byte data of the audio files and do things like uh, create sound mixing boards, all in Flash. So again, it's giving a new set of tools to developers uh, to allow us to start playing with these things. Video is the same thing. And real quick, I'll touch those little hearts up at the top were just kind of my feelings towards the language at the time. Um, this is when I was really starting to love Flash and sort of you know, gaining speed with it. Uh, HTML5 will come later, as you'll see. But video, you know, we had the ability to share our content online uh, for video for the first time with Flash. Um, it allowed you to stream things across multiple sites. Again, interact at a low level with the video file. So if you wanted to do things like trigger events based on a uh, specific position in a video, or you know, scale it even on simple things like play, pause, and seek, progressive seeking and progressive download. Um, so this, again, this brought a whole new generation of video sharing uh, capabilities online. And sites like YouTube were all built around this. Components were another big thing. Um, you know, we have HTML elements, we always have things like text inputs and buttons, and you have some of that same stuff in Flash, but then you have more rich components like the progress bar, um, the scroll pane, and the FLV playback component. So this uh, video playback component here, you could literally drag and drop in Flash onto your stage. You could adjust the controls depending on what you needed, if you wanted to play and pause or you wanted to seek or mute. Uh, you could add all that stuff in and quickly skin it out to your needs and then just start using it in your application. So again, without having to do any development, I was able to add videos in line in a similar fashion to how you can do it with the video element in HTML today. Another big leap forward with Flash was the addition of the hardware APIs. Suddenly, we could access things like the microphone and the webcam. Uh, this is a little photo booth application that I saw online, but people have done some really interesting things, including JibJab, which you guys might know for their more satirical uh, comedy you know, animations. Um, they've used the hardware APIs to actually allow people to become front and center part of the content that they're creating. So JibJab actually created a number of animations uh, and then also included video and audio and then used the hardware API to let people actually include their own faces. So this is something I found on YouTube. It's uh, the Gomez family's vacation video, I guess, but it's all put to Pharrell's happy video. Um, so again, some really interesting stuff that people were able to do that they couldn't really do using just HTML and JavaScript. And that peer-to-peer -peer piece I mentioned earlier, um, this was involved in that game uh, for a peer-to-peer -peer communication. This is a, a picture of a full mesh network topology. So basically every client on the network attaches to every other client or connects to directly. Um, it's not the best scenario, but it works pretty well for you know, under eight or 10 clients. Um, and this is how that game worked. So every person playing that game would connect to every other person playing that game and exchange data directly peer-to-peer -peer across that network. Um, so that reduces latency, you know, gives you the ability to share data very quickly um, and without having to go through a server. So there's no server architecture to set up and there's no bandwidth charges on that side either. So that's some of the features that I worked with in Flash. I spent about 10 years developing a business, Flash Dev for Hire, which aptly described what I did. I worked with a bunch of interesting companies. Um, I created a kid's game along the way called Free Guitars. I worked with Qualcomm, Digitaria. A company called Hanson, we created a, a touchscreen kiosk for doing kitchen designs for a large cabinet manufacturer. Um, I worked with, uh, uh, who was it? Totally lost my space. 
Anyways, moving along, um, we created all sorts of interesting applications uh, using Flash, and it was really you know spread all across the board. Um, the problem is is that I spent all this time really married to Flash. You know, I didn't spend much time working with PHP or JavaScript or HTML or really anything out of ActionScript. Um, I had enough on my plate just to learn all the new things that were coming out with Flash, and so I was happy to ignore the rest of the stuff going on around me. Uh, being married to Flash in this way was something that would kind of set me up for trouble later down the road. So, as I mentioned, things were you know, moving along smoothly, and then the browser wars started. Uh, suddenly, people were ingesting content in a new way. They were turning to their mobile devices, their tablets, their phones, to start browsing the web um, and taking it with them everywhere they went. The problem with this is that Flash didn't really run that well on mobile devices. So Adobe stepped up and spent a few years really working with device manufacturers to get the Flash runtime to run on all their devices. And largely, they were successful. Um, you know, Air ran on Android and on uh, the Google, uh, excuse me, BlackBerry devices. They also ran on Nokia, Sony Ericsson. Um, pretty much every device you can imagine, even Logitech desktop or uh, set-top boxes would run Flash. The one big person that would not run Flash or company was Apple. Um, and Apple refused wholeheartedly to have any sort of uh, Flash content running on the iOS device. Um, this resulted in a very public, very bitter kind of uh, back and forth between Apple and Adobe. It was like nothing I've ever really seen before with publicly traded companies. Um, Apple or Adobe at one point took out a, a full page ad in all the major newspapers during their Big Macs conference that said, what, uh, we love Apple. We love creativity. We love innovation. We love apps. And the end of the, the uh, article said, what we don't love is anybody taking away your freedom to choose what you create, how you create it, and what you experience on the web. So obviously this was a direct slap in the face of Apple, and Apple responded in kind by taking out an article on their own website titled Thoughts on Flash. And it ended with, perhaps Adobe should focus more on creating great HTML5 tools for the future and less on criticizing Apple for leaving the past behind. So at the time, I didn't really understand this. Um, neither of these people said much about why HTML5 was so great. You know, all we were seeing when these articles came out was some simple drawing stuff with JavaScript and the canvas element, some very rudimentary video and audio capabilities, um, but they were all very annoying to use. You had to create multiple copies of your, your audio file, multiple copies of your video file. There was all sorts of transcoding. And you know, given the option between doing all that extra work and simply using the Flash tools that already worked with you know, MP4s alone, it was a simple choice. So you know, they're putting all their, their eggs behind or uh, their backing behind HTML5, but they're not really telling us why this is what they're doing. And so we were a bit confused, but while all this bickering is going on, something kind of interesting happened. This game, Machinarium, which is a uh, puzzle exploration game featuring robots and some really cool art, took uh, number one spot on the iPad paid app store. So number one, right, on iPad. This is on Apple's store. The interesting fact is that this game was actually created in Flash. It had been around on the web for quite some time as a Swift, and uh, they simply transcoded it to run from Flash Professional on an iOS device. So while all this bickering was happening, Adobe had figured out a way to allow you to publish from Flash Professional directly to the Apple iOS environment. Um, it was a pretty cool piece of tech that they built. Uh, Apple you know, figured out what was going on after a while and turned it off. Uh, so you could no longer do it. Even though the feature existed in Adobe Flash Professional, you couldn't actually run it uh, in the iOS store. They would just boot it before it ever got there. So that lasted for about six months. And then they went the other direction, and they allowed it again. So it was in their best interest because they were really just turning off you know, a bunch of developers that could potentially create content for their store by not allowing people to publish in Flash. And this feature actually still exists today. If you want to open up Adobe Flash now and publish for the iPad or for an, uh, an Apple phone, um, you can do that. And it works pretty darn well. So again, you know, we're, we're thinking as Flash developers, as a big community that have been backing Adobe for a very long time that you know, things are going well. We can publish to, to iOS. Uh, maybe there's hope that Flash is going to continue to live on. And just when we thought things were going OK, uh, this happened. Adobe made an announcement on November 9th, 2011, that they would stop development on the Flash player for mobile and focus their efforts on creating mobile experiences using HTML5. So imagine you've been working in this tool for 10 years, and suddenly the company that you've been backing, you're part of the community in, you run a user group for, makes this announcement that they're going to stop backing the tool that they've been fighting tooth and nail to get on all the mobile devices. Um, you know, needless to say, the, uh, the community was both confused. Uh, we felt kind of abandoned. Um, there was a lot of interesting blog posts and tweets going on that day. Um, and a lot of it came down to fear. And this is something I kind of realized later, is that 
you know, again, we'd been married to this tool. This is what we knew how to do. A lot of us made our livelihoods using this technology. And suddenly, we're being told that they're going to go another direction. But where does that leave us as developers, right? We know ActionScript. We know Flash. We know how to create some really interesting applications using it. We don't know much about JavaScript or HTML5. You know, most of us have some understanding of it, but we don't know the, the deep down layers of it. And the idea of having to unlearn everything we'd learn in ActionScript to go back 10 years in time and relearn JavaScript was just kind of a painful concept. Um, but again, there was some hope for this whole HTML5 thing, which we'd, we'd get into later. So let's fast forward to 2015. Uh, you know, HTML5's had a long time to mature. Uh, the early days of simple canvas elements and video players are behind us, thankfully. And we've come a long way. So let's look at some of the features now that were potentially influenced by some of the things that came from Flash, uh, but that are currently available in HTML5. So first, going back to ActionScript 3 versus JavaScript, JavaScript still hasn't come that far as a language. Um, I'm happy to hear you know, talks uh, at this conference even talking about you know, the future of ECMAScript and how that's going to change the way we program with JavaScript on the web. Um, but I have to give a lot of credit back to the JavaScript developer community because you know, in the last several years, there's been a huge number of frameworks and libraries that have come out that allow us as developers to really develop in a, uh, an easier way and a more manageable way. So things like Ember and Backbone and Angular allow you to develop much more complex applications in a more manageable fashion. Um, Node.js allows you to develop JavaScript applications on the server side. I mean, who would ever thought that would exist? jQuery, you know, been around forever, allows you easier access to the DOM. And things like CoffeeScript just make it faster to develop. Um, so some really cool stuff going on there. But again, the future is even brighter because they're finally starting to work on ECMAScript as a, uh, a language, or JavaScript as a language. Animation. So I mentioned uh, that there was some simple stuff going on with Canvas and uh, HTML5 and animation. Um, the Canvas element and the drawing API, uh, APIs in HTML have come a, a long way. Um, this game here, Pirates Love Daisies, is a tower defense game that was created by Grant Skinner's company. The interesting part about that is that Grant Skinner was actually an icon in the Flash development space. Um, and it was at Adobe Max 2011 when he actually gave a talk about building this game. So I'm sitting in the audience going to a Grant Skinner presentation expecting to hear all these cool things about Flash, and here he is talking about that darn HTML5 thing once again. Um, again, I was kind of confused, but in watching Grant, you know, it was, it was kind of clear at that point that there was something behind this. Um, he had created this whole game that he would have normally built in Flash using HTML5 Canvas. But along the way, he had had to create a whole slew of libraries uh, just to help him in building this, uh, which th one of the things that came out of that was a thing called EaselJS, which was later, later developed into uh, CreateJS. And that's just a suite that helps developers who are accustomed to things like um, animating in Flash come over and bring that, that same tool set over to HTML. And that'll be important in a little bit, which we'll get to. 3D animation came later on. So WebGL uh, JavaScript API allows you to create hardware-accelerated 3D graphics that are mobile-optimized. So this is a game called Hello Run. It's a runner game, I guess. Um, but the point here is that the graphics are pretty amazing, and they run just as well on mobile as they do on the browser uh, on your desktop. Audio and video. We talked about this a bit earlier. So this is the new audio element as it stands today. It allows you to simply add uh, video or audio content to your web pages using native HTML. If you want to add controls, it's a simple attribute inclusion. Um, and it's very simple to use. Video is the same thing. Again, controls are available. That's stuff we talked about with the component set being available in Flash to allow you to quickly create Flash uh, video players is now available in HTML5. So again, we're taking a step in the right direction. Uh, components. You know, jQuery UI and a number of other libraries and frameworks out there let you uh, use some very rich components uh, like accordions and uh, modal windows. Um, but there's some new technology coming out for web components, which are even more interesting to me. And this will actually let you create your own component set in HTML. So you define what the element name is, and you can actually create the functionality. So you can reuse it across your applications or share it with other people on the web. Um, and this is an example of Google Map. They actually ported that over to use the, uh, the new web components architecture. Um, so you can see here it's defining a Google map element with a latitude and longitude attribute. And then internally, they've got additional elements for Google map marker. So if anybody here has tried to use Google map APIs previously, uh, there's a lot of configuration that goes on. And it takes quite a bit of code to get something like this to work. Um, whereas maintaining something like this on your, your website would be a lot easier with simple element inclusions. Hardware access. So again, I mentioned this was a huge thing in Flash, and here we have it now in HTML or in JavaScript. Um, you know, things like Get User Media allow you access to the microphone and to the webcam. So as a developer in JavaScript, now you can access those same APIs that we used to have in Flash and start playing around with them. 
And a lot of these elements came together to uh, bring us WebRTC. Now, this is kind of a new uh, technology. It's still being built up by, uh, by Google and Firefox and Opera, actually. Um, and IE is kind of coming out with their own version of this, so they're you know, leading the tail end of it, but they're finally coming around. Um, basically, WebRTC allows you to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection across various network topologies. So it doesn't matter if the person you're talking to is behind some crazy firewall and you're on a public network at a coffee shop, you should still be able to connect. Um, and all that tech that figures out basically how to connect two browsers peer-to-peer -peer is included in WebRTC. Um, so things like video calling, audio calling, even uh, web to phone and phone to web are now available as part of this stack. Uh, screen sharing is another feature. And uh, just to give you guys a little better idea of what people are doing with this, let's take a look at a couple of the applications that people have created so far. Um, so you may have seen some commercials a while back for Amazon Mayday service. Uh, this service basically allows you to hit a button on your Kindle and be talking live with you know, apparently a very friendly uh, customer support representative. It also gives them access to draw and access elements on your screen so they can help you figuring out uh, you know, troubleshooting issues. Um, so this uses WebRTC. Google Hangouts used to be a plug-in based uh, system. Now it uses WebRTC, so they're kind of eating their own dog food there, which is great. Allows for video calling, screen sharing. And I should mention, this is all native in the browser. There's no plugins required. This just all runs. So as long as you have a browser that supports WebRTC, which again is kind of growing as we go, uh, you can use this, and your users can too. Pure CDN was a really cool idea. Uh, it's basically a simple JavaScript library that uh, uses WebRTC to create a CDN of the users on your uh, website. So if you have a bunch of static assets, images, video files, PDFs, whatever it may be, uh, this JavaScript library basically scrubs your pages to find those files and then finds the users that are accessing your website and connects them peer to peer. So if one person downloads all the files and other people come to join the site, they can then distribute those across a peer to peer connection to the other users, thus saving you a lot of money in bandwidth. Uh, you can see here there's some numbers. Um, you know, I don't know how pertinent those are here, but they can show you exactly how many terabytes and how many megabytes you've saved, as well as the, uh, the amount of money you've saved. And these guys actually got bought by Yahoo rather recently. Um, so you might see some cool stuff coming out from that. Uh, CubeSlam was a game that Google threw together as a proof of concept. It uses audio and video, as well as uh, exchanging game data across peer-to-peer uh, -peer connection. So it's a simple game of Pong uh, with video as the background and then audio communications. But it exchanges all that data, the game data, you know, the positions of the, the paddles on the screen, the position of the puck, um, everything across the WebRTC peer-to-peer -peer connection. So again, it's using one API to exchange all that game data without having to you know, spin up a server and host some third-party library to actually handle um, all the game data you know, interaction. Um, and it's also saving you a ton of money on bandwidth, again, there. This is Apollo. Uh, this is a game we created internally at the company I work for uh, for doing communications uh, with our distributed team. So it's, it's sort of like a you know, bigger version of a Google Hangouts um, with some features that we wanted. So things like group chat, um, single chat, video and audio calling, as well as uh, file exchange, my favorite feature. Um, you can actually copy to the clipboard using like a screenshot and paste it into the chat window. And it'll automatically share it out with the rest of the people um, that are included in that group. So I mentioned we spoke. Just a real quick plug here. Uh, we do simple WebRTC stuff. So if you're ever looking to play with this and you don't want to spin up your own servers, um, we have a JavaScript platform that allows you to easily start adding things like video calling uh, into your applications. So you can check us out at Respoke.io. Um, so Flash, kind of a recap. You know, why did HTML5 win over Flash, and, and kind of what happened to Flash over the years? Um, the biggest thing is that HTML5 is native, and it runs extremely well across all devices. Uh, so Flash's big failure was really in the ability to uh, have it run smoothly and consistently across all the mobile devices, tablets, the phones, and the desktop. Um, they did a pretty good job. You know, I wouldn't say that Apple shut them down. It certainly didn't help. Obviously, they found a workaround for it. But at the end of the day, um, there's a much larger community of front-end developers and JavaScript developers that can play with this technology. So having things run you know, in HTML5 just exposes it to a larger audience of developers. And it makes it more available to a larger number of people. Um, so Flash, as I mentioned, uh, not quite dead. Um, sort of rising from the grave, this animation here, what do you think I used to make this? Shout it out, anybody. Nailed it. So I actually created this in Flash. Um, I don't know if I can show you guys. We're kind of running out of time here. But uh, basically, Flash went a different direction. They learned from what was happening. You know, uh, People wanted a different experience. HTML5 was the winner. That's what they chose to back. So they chose to actually pivot and learn from their like mistakes and from what was coming up next to kind of stay relevant. 
So now in Flash, you can actually publish all of your HTML or your uh, Flash content, your timeline animations, your scripted animations, all to HTML5 content. So it uses the canvas. And if you remember what I was talking about Grant Skinner earlier, creating that game with EaselJS and the CreateJS framework, um, Adobe actually worked with Grant Skinner to include that CreateJS framework as part of their Flash publishing platform. So when you publish from Flash, it actually converts all of your action script code, your timeline uh, inclusions, and all of your assets to be native HTML5 content uh, using the canvas and using CreateJS as the library that then uh, transitions all that stuff over to JavaScript and HTML. So what the, the end result is, is you get an HTML file and a JavaScript file, which you can then edit to your, your heart's content. Um, and it's all written using that CreateJS platform. So if you want to go in and start playing around with it, um, use Flash as a simple tool to get you some basic animations or some prototyping, the end result is going to be JavaScript and HTML, which you can then edit and, and play with from there. So kind of to recap everything here, you know, the big thing I want you guys to take away from this, and this is sort of a theme I've been happy to hear from a lot of talks at this conference, is really never stop learning. Um, you need to keep pushing yourself forward. You know, Adobe did that when Flash uh, kind of lost out to HTML5. Um, I had to do that when my business was, you know, forced to be changed to more of an HTML5-focused uh, business. Um, so I just want to challenge everybody here, you know, set aside an hour a week, just one hour. You know, block it off on your calendar, turn off your cell phone, lock the door, whatever you got to do. And just spend that time really trying something new, whether it's a framework or doing what John suggested yesterday, doing some creative coding or playing with a new piece of hardware, or even you know, just going out and learning a new sport. Whatever it is, try something new and keep learning because it's going to push you to be a better developer and you know, just a better human being, really. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, my contact info here, ktayak at respoke.io. You can catch me on Twitter at geekgonnomad, and my website's under the same uh, with a dot com on the end. I'll uh, open it up to questions. So the question was about the differences between ORTC, which uh, IE is developing, and WebRTC, which everybody else is developing. Um, the answer is I really, really hope they're going to be similar, uh, if not the same. Um, some of the proposals that uh, IE has made have actually been folded into the WebRTC spec. So some of the stuff they're actually finding as you know, potential issues or things they want changed are actually good suggestions. Um, my real hope is that eventually they'll get on board in some later version of the spec. Um, I've heard some talk that you know, they're basically waiting until it's a little bit more finalized or standardized um, to implement in their browser. So my hope is that this ORTC thing is just uh, their sort of way of you know, getting their suggestions across and that eventually they're just going to take the full spec and implement it as is. Um, I won't hold my breath on that one, but I'm, I'm really hoping for it. So, and if anybody wants to talk WebRTC, I'll be around the rest of the day. Uh, feel free to grab me, and I'd, I'd love to chat on it with you. So, thanks.